Hello everybody, Father Cooper here. Uh, I've been honored with the uh, task of, of giving you the lecture for uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 for this part of our crossword study. Um, here I am uh, recording this lecture into a camera, so if it uh, seems awkward, please forgive me. I'm actually on take three of, of doing this lecture. Uh, trying to figure it out. Um, I'd much rather be in front of all of you guys, uh, you know, making a fool out of myself in person. Instead, I'm in my guest bedroom um, with my my dogs, who are, uh, you know, being very attentive to me. And, uh, of course, they think everything I say is just absolute gold. I'm the smartest person. You can ask them. And so uh, they're happy to, to hear what I have to say today. But I hope all of you are doing well. And uh, and okay, so let's go ahead and get into it. We're in 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, where uh, Peter is mainly concerned with talking about false prophets, who false prophets are, um, how they've existed in the, uh, even in the old times, in the old, te in the old testament, and even before then. And he, really, he's exhorting uh, his audience to remain faithful. That's sort of his message in 2 Peter, in 1 Peter, in a lot of Paul's writing, and I know I think he cites Paul later on, which su suggests that Paul's all of Paul's letters have been sort of gathered into a uh, into a sort of a corpus, a body of works, meaning that a a New Testament is sort of forming right now. I think Peter writes this knowing that this sort of development is happening. Um, and uh, so he is establishing a connection, really, between what's happening now in the first century and what has gone before. So there's a sort of continuity uh, that's being highlighted between God and his response to prophets in the Old Testament and what he's doing even now. And I'd like for us to begin by sort of backing up into uh, what Father John was covering last week. And this is in... Uh, this isn't, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I promise I don't have the coronavirus. This is in uh, chapter 1, verse 16, and I'll go ahead and read it to you. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So this shows that this story, the story of the, the transfiguration, had already been written out, too, which is kind of cool. Uh, sorry, I got distracted. Uh, verse 18, We heard this voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain, and we had the prophetic word made more sure. And then, you will do well to pay attention to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place. <coughs> Excuse me. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Because no prophecy ever came by the impulse of man, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. This little section, particularly the part where, you know, we have Peter claiming to be an eyewitness, which we know to be true. And then the understanding that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Because no prophecy ever came by the impulse of man, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And then he gets into false prophets. So... If you want truth, if you want sort of a correct interpretation of what you're reading in Scripture, you have to look at it um, as sort of backed up by the rest of the body of Scripture. And also, it's helpful to have an authority behind it, such as Peter himself, or the church's testimony supporting that Scripture. And we'll get more into that uh, later, if, that, if what I said makes sense at all. But Peter talks about false prophets arising among the people, um, secretly um, bringing in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And there is a, uh, that's an important note about what a heresy actually is. There are bold heresies such as, for example, Arianism, which is uh, 
which sort of swept through Christianity in the uh, in the fourth and fifth centuries and was you know huge, which denied the divinity of Jesus Christ, believing that Jesus was a man who was an adopted son of God, rather than the eternally begotten Son of God, sharing of the same nature of the Father. That was a big heresy that threatened the church for centuries. But there is, I would argue, a more dangerous form of heresy, and those are the subtle heresies. Um, and these are where false teachers really come in. False teachers have heard the Word of God. They've heard the Scripture. They've heard the prophecies. But then, whether in sort of they try to manipulate uh, theology, manipulate doctrine to sort of fit their own purposes um, such so that they can uh, really appeal to people's hearts, or they manipulate it to today's culture and the sentiments of the world today so that it, it fits, right? Um, where the, so that the gospel and the message of scripture doesn't seem so at odds, Um with the world around us. And that's a big problem, especially in today's church. Um, in the first century church, um, you had people that, you know, Paul really tried to argue against, uh, such as uh, the Jews who believed that that Gentile Christians, for them to become real Christians, they had to become Jews first, right? And so therefore, they had to be circumcised. This was a false teaching um, that was very divisive in the early church. And you have other false teachings that Peter was dealing with, such as uh, how do Christians interact with idols or were food offered to idols and stuff like that? Or how do Christians uh, relate to the emperor at this time? And that was a huge issue that, uh, that St. John likes to address in his letters and particularly in Revelation. Um, so the first century church was rampant with false teachings and false prophets, just as even today we are experiencing false prophets, whether it's uh, televangelists um, like Joel Osteen or Kenneth Copeland or, or stuff like that, or, uh, or or leaders in our own traditions that are trying to uh, mold the gospel into something that's more presentable to today's 21st century culture, particularly with teachings on, on marriage and ordination. Um, they're trying to change these things in order uh, to make them more palatable to our own uh, 21st century standards. But Peter's saying, hey, no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. We don't, do not have the authority to change what has been written. We don't have, we personally, we individuals do not have the authority to bend the gospel, to bend teachings to suit our own, uh, our, our own gain, to work for us. We work for Scripture. Scripture does not work for us. Um, that's an important reminder for us today, especially. And uh, Peter gets into sort of what happens uh, to, uh, to the false prophets. And basically, God is not going to be very pleased with them. He cites uh, the angels. Um, who, uh, even before we have any writings on, in, in Scripture of false prophets, we have angels who saw God face to face. They saw truth face to face and turned away. And he says, for God, Peter says, For God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of neither gloom to be kept until the judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserve Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven other persons, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes he condemned them to extinction and made them in exile to those who were to be ungodly, yada, 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 then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial. So he's saying God is always going to punish the wicked, but to those who remain faithful, to those who remain righteous, God will preserve them. But the key in the important detail here is that God wants you to remain faithful. And how do you do it? By following, by following authority and not changing Scripture, by understanding uh, what uh, Scripture is. And uh, Peter goes on in uh, talking about uh, the 
the judgment brought on to false prophets uh, by God himself. And God has a very specific response to the false prophets, saying that, you know, they're going to be cast down to hell. They are going to uh, be utterly destroyed. This is what God does in uh, the Old Testament, uh, you know, citing Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels, uh, the unrighteous people of Noah's day. And he even talks about a guy named Balaam, son of Beor who loved gain from wrongdoing, and that's in verse uh, 15 of chapter 2. And I was actually supposed to give a uh, teaching on Balaam, son of Beor. Um, it's a story that occurs in Numbers chapter 22. Um, the Israelites are uh, encamped in the, in the fields of Moab. That's, um, if you want to know where modern-day Moab is, it's on the... Uh, the eastern side of the Dead Sea. It's a very deserty place. And uh, the Israelites are there sort of on the edge of the promised land. They're waiting to get in. And uh, the king of Moab, I believe it's Balak or something like that, uh, comes to uh, Balaam and says, hey, I got a job for you. I'm going to pay you. I need you to go over to these Israelites, this vast nation, and I need you to curse them. Curse them. That way I can defeat them. And so Balaam's like, all right, this sounds like a pretty good deal for me. And so he goes off to curse them. And long story short, on the way to curse them, God speaks to him and says, hey, don't do this. These are my people. Stay away. Don't curse my people. Balaam hears God, and basically Balaam ignores God. Balaam is more concerned with his own good rather than God's plan. And so eventually... Balaam is riding his faithful donkey to go curse the Israelites, and an angel of the Lord appears in the path in front of him. But Balaam doesn't see him, but his donkey does. So his donkey tries to turn away, off the path. Balaam, in a fit of rage, beats his donkey and tries to get him to keep going. The angel of the Lord appears again. Um, this time, Balaam doesn't see him, but the donkey does. And so the donkey is trying to get away from this scary angel holding a flaming sword and uh, brushes Balaam's leg up against a wall, Balaam is overcome with rage and beats his donkey, tries to get him to go. Finally, in a very narrow path, um, Balaam and his donkey are going, going along, and the angel of the Lord appears. This way, And in this scenario, the donkey can't turn to the right or to the left, um, but in fear, finally lays down with Balaam on top of him. And Balaam is so angry, um, but the donkey basically turns to him and speaks. God speaks through the donkey um, and says, hey, why are you beating me, man? <laughs> God is trying to tell you something. You need to listen. And that is my uh, sort of Cliff Notes Reader's Digest version of the story. If you want a bit of a more reverent take, I would suggest you go to uh, Numbers chapter 22 and read it yourself. It's a very good story. It's a funny story about how God speaks to people even when they're trying to ignore him. And so Balaam is one of these false prophets uh, that uh, is trying to seek his own gain. He doesn't want to listen to God. He's, he's more interested in getting paid by this king of the Moabites. And God speaks to him saying, hey, listen to me. And so, Peter goes on about who these uh, false prophets are. In verse 17, he says, These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the, for them, the nether gloom of darkness has been reserved. For uttering loud boasts of folly, they entice with licentious passions of the flesh men who have barely escaped from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. These false prophets are trying to appeal to people by whatever means necessary, whether it's through lustful passions or gain or anything like that. Uh, they're going to try to entice you to follow after them. And so, the question is, how can we recognize these people? Well, Peter has given us a pretty good lesson on what to look for. Um, they're blaspheming about matters for which they are ignorant. And so, therefore, how do we remain uh, unignorant? I'm not sure what the correct word for that is. Um, I, I don't know. Unig we're going to go with unignorant. How do we remain unignorant so that we are not led away by false prophets? <laughs>
and we are beset on every side, especially in today's age, with false teachings. How do we remain true to the doctrine handed down to us? And this is something that I've been trying to hammer home uh, to our confirmation class uh, this year, is how do we maintain our faith when the world is trying to get us to turn away from it? Well, our number one way of staying true to the good news handed down to us is through the study of Scripture. And if you're listening to this uh, online lecture, then you're on a good track because you are studying Scripture. We need to be familiar with the words that are written in it because false teachers are constantly going to try to cite Scripture in order to get us to turn away from the true gospel. If you want a good example, you can go to Matthew uh, chapter 4, I believe, where when Jesus is in the wilderness being tempted by Satan, Satan himself is trying to quote scripture to him. Um, by, you know, what does he say? He says, uh, he, he quotes how, how uh, God won't let your foot be dashed by a stone and stuff like that uh, in order to you know fall off the temple. Um, go to Matthew chapter 4 if you want a better uh understanding of that. But basically, if Satan is going to cite scripture at us, or a false teacher is going to, to cite scripture at us in order to try to confuse us and get us to turn away. And it's really easy to do if we don't intensely study God's word. So we need to always be dipping into scripture so that we can't have it used against us. Finally, tradition. And this is what Peter is alluding to as an authority within the church. You know, P Peter is an eyewitness. And also, no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. It has to be backed by authority. And that's where we get the tradition of the church. The faith handed to the apostles and the faith that the apostles handed down to their successors one by one by one to be kept sacred and holy by successive bishops, even to our own bishop today, Bishop Reed, and then uh, your fellow clergy of St. Lawrence who have been entrusted by our bishop to teach and, and offer the sacraments uh, by his authority. We have a, a system in place that's 2,000 years old that we can fall back on. Whenever we have uh, questions about a certain scripture passage, we can look at the church's teaching that has always been taught. We can look at the church fathers, and we can ask our own clergy about it, and they can explain it to us. It's dangerous to, to look at scripture and interpret it for ourselves. Uh, not because we are inherently evil or something like that, or, or that we're trying to seek our own gain, but because it's easy to mess up. It's easy to get stuff wrong, especially with a document that's as old as as the Bible that has many different meanings in many different contexts, it always helps to uh, to look up our answers, to look up our um, and see what people have said about this, so that we can be edified, so that we can grow, and so that we can be uh, taught by the church, which is infused with the Holy Spirit. Um, we can go all the way back to Pentecost, where the Holy where the Holy Spirit rested on the apostles and gave them the authority to teach. And through that tradition, we can look especially to uh, uh, councils of the church where they've met to decide doctrine, and that leads us again to uh, the creeds, the statements of faith. And there are three big statements of faith that we can look to. The Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed. And one uh, of the requirements for our confirmation class is to have the Apostles' Creed memorized and it's important to understand and to know these creeds because they are the clearest um, and they are the foundational statements of what we believe and of, of who we believe God the Father is, God the Son is, and God the Holy Spirit is. These are how we protect ourselves uh, from false teachings and false prophets. We look, we look to authority. We look to, uh, to Peter and the apostles. We look to the church fathers. We look to our own bishops. And we look at scripture, and we, and we look at the creeds, and we put all these three things together, and then we have a holy, good, and right teaching that we can be confident in. So beware of false prophets. They're everywhere, and they're easy to sort of fall in line with because their message is inherently going to be easier than the message that Jesus gave us. But that's okay.
I mean, Jesus' life wasn't easy. He came to die for us so that we can offer our lives to him. Um, and he can give us the strength to do that so long as we are willing to, uh, to educate ourselves and to build a, a strong foundation for ourselves so that we won't be led astray. Um, yeah, so we won't be led astray. We want to remain in Jesus' loving arms, not the arms of some sort of wolf um, in shepherd's clothing. So keep the faith, stay strong, study the scripture, um, and, uh, and look to the church to, to offer you helpful teachings on the scripture and what the Holy Spirit is saying. Okay, I hope you have a great uh, crossword Bible study, and uh, thank you all.